All right. Uh, so uh, it's uh, 2 p.m. So I, I, th I think we are ready. Uh, then uh, my name is Jakub Krzeski and I'm a member of um, Scholarly Communication Research Group. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to our fifth seminar in the, seri in the series on science and uh, peripheries. And uh, this time we have a very special ple pleasure to host a meeting with uh, Professor Mikhail Vusokolov from European University at St. Petersburg, who will share with us his, um, his research on paying in attention the art of ignoring others' work among Russian social scientists. Uh, Professor Sokolov, as I mentioned, uh, is employed um, at the St. Petersburg University. Um, his, his main scientific research interests lie in subjects related to sociology and history of social sciences, sociology of culture, social stratification in post-Soviet societies, and micro-sociological -soci theory by Irving Goffman. But we also have with us um, another person who will be acting as a co-presenter to uh, Professor Sokolov's thesis. And this is uh, our friend from our research group, uh, Dr. Zehra Tashkin, uh, who is currently a visiting professor here at our research um, group. Um, and uh, Dr. Tashkin, uh, her, her work uh, is primarily about content-based citation analysis. She is currently conducting a research project here with us on this topic. So just to give you a brief outline of how we will proceed during this seminar, I will now give voice to Professor Sokolov and he will present his, um, his research. Uh, after about 30 minutes, uh, Dr. Tashkin will join us with her comments. She will have about 15 minutes to uh, give some insight, to propose some directions on how we can together um, tackle problems posed by Professor Sokolov. Then I will give back voice to Professor Sokolov so he can respond to Dr. Tashkin's comments. And then I will open the floor for all the particip participants of today's seminar and we will hold a joint discussion. So without further ado, I would like to greatly warm Professor Sokolov with us and uh, invite him to um, start his presentation. Thank you so much. It's my great pleasure to be virtually here. Uh, uh, my talk today will, be, will have two aims. One of them would be to try to explain a specific and empirical phenomenon, the emergence and existence of information bubbles in social sciences. And the second one would be a, an attempt to contribute to the development of a more general theory of academic recognition based on Erwin Goffman's theory of communicative conduct. Um, One of the one of usual complaints inside sociology is that sociology is um, divided by information bubbles in which sociologists exists exist and uh, are either unaware of the developments outside of this bubble, honestly unaware, or repressing. Uh, any kind of awareness they have got, not recognizing that something is happening out there. Um, one of the first criticism of this kind, the ones I am aware about, uh, came from Peter M. Sorokin, who wrote a book in 1950s, 1956, on fa uh, feds and foibles in modern sociology, and it includes um, a chapter on New Columbus's criticizing American sociologists of Sorokin's generation of ignoring European thought, philosophy, everything except American sociology itself. And that is a usual complaint. It was reproduced many times. Uh, Herbert Gens in 1993, um, being a president of the American Sociological Association, uh, gave a presidential talk called Sociological Amnesia, and dealing with different so generations in American sociology, which against argues um, forget about the about the preceding generation. The usual uh, cycle of development of an empirical field is like that: there is 
uh, a generation putting forward a strong thesis and then a generation putting an other thesis and then uh, the next generation comes but counter to what one might expect the what uh, the third generation brings in with itself is not synthesis but the older thesis again but now it's completely forgotten that uh, anybody put forward was already uh, telling this uh, an example from sociology of social movements uh, there is a strong tradition in symbolic interaction in studies of uh, social movements from 1940s and 1960s and then uh, 1950s right? and then 60s come and the participants of the movement itself are developing other approach to the same problem the older one was based on the ideas of symbolic interaction and the newer ones are much more uh, rational choice oriented, discussing mobilization of resources, structures of opportunities, and then a new generation comes and they return to the questions of identity and meanings, but they do not are not aware of anything happening in 1950s or 19, uh, early 1960s. They are believing they are the first one to whom the idea occurred of um, a symbolic dimension. Uh, existing in collective actions or identity being important, not only uh, rational choice. Um, a more general tackle of the same problem related to social scientific disciplines could be found in the more recent books by Evert Azarobavil, dealing with conspiracies of silence, situations in which something is happening, everybody is aware that this is happening, but everybody is collectively denying this thing occurring. And he uses various examples varying from uh, Holocaust to, to social scientific disciplines, which are very, very good in denying that anything occurring outside of their bubble. Uh, economists are good at ignoring sociologists. Sociologists are good at ignoring economists. At best, they have some kind of a very distorted picture of the other discipline. Sociology think that econ economics is are always about home economicals and it's unrealistic and not interesting and um, economists think that sociology is about values and the sociologists are unable to calculate and they are of no interest as well um, so they are quite good at producing very similar findings without ever acknowledging that uh, they're not the first who arrived to this conclusion uh, Studying sociology in Russia is a very attractive prospect from this point of view, as it's full of such battles. It's kind of a major form of existence of Russian sociologists. Uh, my colleagues and I first arrived at this problem when we tried to do a sort of a micro history or a community study of sociology in St. Petersburg, major Russian city, which hosts around 10% of all Russian sociologists, however you calculate the number of sociologists, uh, around 10% of them would be residing in Leningrad and now St. Petersburg. And that's like 300 people active in this field for, for at least 50 years. So uh, our idea was to try to uh, get as much information as possible about these people, to try to trace their biographies. Um, we delivered questionnaires, we took interviews, we made bibliometric analysis of all the intellectual products, and we reconstructed the field as, as it evolved. Another source of data was a, uh, is an ongoing um, reputation survey of social scientists, um, which officially is aimed at trying to find a correlation uh, between or find out that there is no correlation between scientometric measures, uh, various measures, and the results of reputation surveys among one's peers. So scientometrics is often criticized for the fact that uh, citation doesn't capture uh, reputation, but uh, we did some kind of surveys, surprisingly, some, some, somehow scandalously, uh, there is quite, quite a sizable correlation. So you can uh, predict the results of reputation surveys if you know uh, citation indexes, various measures based on them. Uh, but outside of this project, we could analyze in different ways that data gather. There is lots of data 
there will be an even more sizable study of economists this fall and and political scientists. Uh, but with sociologists, we were able to get a sample of all publishing authors due to the Russian Index for Scientific, Sci uh, scientific Citing, which covers all kinds of products in Russian and uh, partly in English language by Russian scholars. And from this, we could, uh, we could survey the whole population. So we send around 300, uh, 3,900 questionnaires, and we got 1,000 responses, and we were able to reconstruct a network of nominations. People were asked questions like, whom would you nominate for, for a medal for contribution to the development of Russian sociology? Or if there is a uh, panel, uh, ex expert panel deciding on uh, awarding major grants, whom you would nominate for participation in this panel, or who produced research in recent years, which uh, you find of the most interest in Russian sociology, not necessarily your fields. Um, a variety of these questions could be asked, and what we construct from this is a network of nomination, a B-model network. Uh, so you see that the Russian sociologists, which are which is nominated most often, is Jean Terentievich Toshenko, and an interesting thing about this, bring us closer to the present subject, that is that uh, the nominations are very clearly dividing the sociological population into two parts. Uh, there are some major uh, minor segments. Uh, we used a modularity detection algorithm for identifying them, uh, but two of them are including like 80% of all people involved, or of all people. Uh, mentioned and of all people participating in the survey. And what we see is that they are quite isolated from one another. Uh, people who are nominating Toshchenko would not nominate Rodaev or Wachstein and vice versa. Uh, oh, sorry, let's just go this way. Um, an earlier study of St. Petersburg allowed us to reconstruct the attention space at uh, existed in the city in, in the more details and uh, correlated with various attributes of scientists, but it was based uh, basically along the same scale. Uh, you find out that there are a major divide between two population of sociologists. We find out that people are mostly unaware or professed unaware of somebody on the other part of this uh, divide. And that surprisingly, they were quite good at ignoring others who were on the same part of this divide as well. So the major divide, oh no, I don't know why I'm going back every time. Um, so we find that there are two major segments different in age, uh, political affinities, one of them mostly liberal, the other one mostly conservative in the specific meaning of this word in Russia. Uh, well, most importantly, they were divided but by what we call isolationist and assimilationist views. The isolationists ge generally believe that there is a specific Russian sociology, uh, sociology addressing the specific needs of Russian society and that all kind of international theorizing is of little value and that from, from the point of view of studying Russian society and that correspondingly international publications or reading books in English are not as important as publishing and reading in Russian. And the assimilationists were uh, on the opposite pole in all of the senses believing that Russian scholarship is inferior, of little interest, that everybody should try to publish in English and should not read anything well, written in Russian. So this is the scale as it as it be used in uh, 2009, um, and it's fa uh, factor loadings. Uh, we reproduced uh, this um, uh, in the previous year in the, fra in the frame of the reputation survey, and it very nicely describes the division which as it exists in Russian sociology as a whole. Um, so, this is the divide, and this is a corresponding divide in the institutional basis. If you have a look here, you find out that there are different universities, and isolationists are mostly based, are mostly universities teachers, 
and are mostly teachers in the second year universities like Hudson Pedagogical University and some mining centers. And that assimilationists are mostly in the higher school of economics and some research institute. So they have different bases. Uh, what is, uh, given these differences, we can uh, suggest that there are all other kinds of differences as well. That there are differences in theoretical or methodological preferences, that there are differences in the vision of sociology public role, and that there are different preferences in terms of field of study. But surprisingly, this is not the case. Uh, when we conducted the study in 2009, the assimilationists mostly declare their preference for qualitative research, but it is not more the case as actually the young generation of assimilationists are uh, mostly studying quantitative methodology. Um, our study from 2009 then was considered uh, an exemplary quantitative study, and now we are ashamed of showing it to our own students because they say that this is not how the quantitative research should be conducted and they are quite well they are obviously superior in master of quantitative methods so we ask all kinds of questions about if qualitative or qualitative methodology is of more value or if sociologists should try to emulate natural sciences or if uh, social science humanities represent different kind of uh, approach to understanding uh, all kinds of questions which are usually assumed to be dividing sociologists. And there were no difference. There were no difference in definition of public role. The isolationists were mostly more uh, friendly to the idea of giving advice and consult to, uh, to the state and to public administration, but the difference was mostly because assimilations were very critical of the present Russian state and isolationists were at least much more favorable to it. But seemingly that was the only difference. There were no difference in, um, say, a relative value ascribed to uh, participation in public enlightenment and or, or purely scholarly academic research. Um, and there were no difference in subject of study. Again, that was a hypothesis that subject of study are some, are somewhat very much uh, um, they are able to attract different uh, parts of sociological population. Say, one could expect that there would be more gender studies on assimilationist side, or more research in history of Russian sociology. But most of it proved untrue as well. Uh, there were gender studies on both sides of the device, but those who criticized them were completely unaware. And as I uh, said, there is a, in, in a important degree of personal canceling, particularly among assimilationists. They were divided. There were some well-known animosities with people doing the same kind of research, say importing Bourdieu to Russia and trying to act as the major representative of Bourdieu and sociology in Russia. And they completely ignored each other. Uh, in the paper, um, uh, in the paper I sent to Emmanuel, uh, that was an there are some anecdotes about how it's happened, like do people, three people doing research in organized crime in St. Petersburg and actually dealing with the same gangs and citing the same sources are never recognized that uh, they know of each other or at best say that they know X, but X is doing the research of in very, very inferior quality, so should not be paid attention to. Um, why such thing could happen? Uh, my next thesis is that they present sort of anomaly from the point of view of uh, class, uh, classical theories of recognition and citing. These two subjects were very much intertwined in the recent decades, uh, giving the importance of citing in our uh, present science policy. There were some attempts to understand what citing is, what citing is about. Uh, it's necessary if we try to interpret citation counts as or set, different citation measures as measures of impact uh, to uh, explain why people cite at all. So the theories of distribution of recognition, starting with Merton, 
are very much intertwined with various theories of society. And here we find usually the uh, opposition presented as a divide between uh, normative and constructivist theories with normative theories recognized by, represented by Martin himself in whom say, scholars uh, search for relevant information uh, and when they find it, they exchange it for public recognition, which among other things took form of public citing. So citing, uh, obligatory citing, the necessity of society, the duty to cite, is a form of recognizing intellectual property rights, are uh, functional from the point of view of uh, facilitating free exchange of information between scholars. Uh, that view was criticized by, uh, I guess, that Nigel Gilbert's 1977 paper was the first, but it's most best known due to presentation by Bruno Latour in Science in Action. Um, and this uh, line of reasoning argues that scholars use citation rhetorically. They are not citing to pay their debts. They are citing to convince their readers, editors of journals, their audiences. So they took the cited authors as hostages, as Latour calls it. Uh, and there are some di uh, interesting differences between their understanding of the citing process. First, if uh, in Merton's case, what is important in the decision to cite is first the order relevance, I cite papers which I believe are relevant. Um, here in Gilbert and Latour and others is the second order re relevance. I cite sources which I believe my readers think are relevant, whatever I think of them myself. Secondly, attention third, uh, search is different from recognition. In Merton, we find important information and we then recognize its, its value. In the case of Latour's schema, actually, we could find information in one place, and our citing doesn't depend on the actual source of information. It's even possible that we take ideas from one source, and then we cite another source if the source is more respectable, and or we believe it's more valuable as a hostage. Uh, and it allows uh, the possibility of pluralistic ignorance, uh, meaning that it's possible, how do we know what other people are recognized, uh, are recognized as important? Well, we know this because they cite it, but maybe they cite it because they believe that still others think the source are important. Nobody, uh, the sources have no first order relevance at all. Nobody believes this important text. Nobody takes information from this text, but we're still uh, ceremonially um, uh, uh, side them, and possibility of pluralistic ignorance emerges. Uh, there is a third view, which sometimes is merged together with the second, but which is, uh, I would say, still distinctive. And this is a view uh, from works by Susan Cousins and Blaise Croning, uh, and they view citation as a form of a status construction. As Republic recognition has its value, it's a part of constructing academic status, people could exchange it. Uh, I said people who cite my papers. Even if I don't think too much value in them, I like them citing me. So we are participating in sort of an um, accelerated tit for tat. You cite me, I said you will create a kind of a citation capital. Um, finally, this is a paper by Nicolaison, which tries to apply uh, some work by Nicolaison, uh, citation as, uh, which deals with citation as a sort of a self-imposed handicap. When I cite a source, I open myself to criticism. Somebody can say that I understand Merton wrongly, or I understand Cousins wrongly, and that makes me vulnerable to, uh, to intellectual face loss. Uh, so when I cite many sources, I open myself to this kind of criticism to demonstrate that I'm not afraid of this. And Nicolaison takes examples from signal theory and from biology to claim that this is, it captures the nature of the citing process. Uh, oh my God, why it returns me to the beginning every time. Uh, but why people could uh, ignore potentially relevant work? 
It seems that there such behavior as we observe among Soviet and post-Soviet sociologists is a sort of an anomaly from most of these views. Why could somebody ignore the sources which are on the first view are the most relevant if there are no different theoretical or methodological or some kind of philosophical? presupposition. Um, a strategy exchange approach offers one, uh, one argument. Well, people may not cite each other to penalize others for no co non-cooperating. If somebody does not cite me, I uh, does not, uh, do not cite him or her, and that's why we are not ignoring, why we are ignoring each other. And this is a possibility, but it is hardly the whole story. And Kunlik explain the emergence of the device we observe in Russia. Some other things seem uh, important and relevant here. First of all, as Nikolai points, uh, citing, at least credible citing, is costly. You need to search literature, find relevant sources, be sure that you understand them correctly, nobody finds a mistake in your uh, argument, and that takes time and effort. Second, in much wisdom is much grief. Sometimes, particularly in social sciences, after certain literature, we can find that somebody, we can find our favorite ideas in them. We believe that this is our insights and then we're searching literature and find out that we were preceded. This is the case with natural sciences as well as social scientists, beginning with Watson's memoirs, we can provide lots of illustration of um, the, uh, the emotions with which most uh, natural sciences are scanning literature being not of joy, but of horror. You can open a journal and find out that your ideas are already there. You have no priority. And in social sciences, it's particular sociology, I would say, it's even more problematic because we can find out that we were preceded by decades. Merton, who were aware of this possibility, are uh, introduced in one way there in one paper an idea of preventive plagiarism, which he claims that the most uh, outrageous form of plagiarism. It's when you find out that somebody published your favorite, stolen your favorite idea and published it long before you were born. And that's a usual thing with sociology, which, uh, which uh, in fact hardly have any kind of insight, uh, not familiar to of fiction authors or philosophers in the ancient world. Uh, so given this, why anybody search literature at all? Well, uh, the most likely answer is that this is a possibility of face loss, because if you don't know a source and somebody in your audience knows it, you are demonstrating that your ability to search literature is not credible enough that you jeopardize the possibility of accumulation of social science, ignoring important literature, offended some people, but not by not paying attention to their work. And this is a kind of a scene which, uh, which is usually uh, punished by, by somebody in audiences. So audience, our audience serve as in, enforcers of information search. We search literature to be aware of what they were. And this different, Oh my God, uh, definitely opens the possibility of cooperation between us. They, the audiences, can be not aware, uh, not pay attention to sources, and that saves them time. And for us, this is an option because it allows us to introduce uh, some ideas as our own, even though they were uh, already put forward by somebody else. In the worst case, we can even take others' ideas and say these are our ideas. But even we do not uh, look at these possibilities, unpleasant possibilities, there are still much status to be gained from these possibilities. So um, we could exist in the bubble. The bubble allows us to uh, produce uh, novelty, to make to convert local news something new to the participants of this particular audience to a global news everybody believes that nobody ever came to this idea and these are some kinds of organization tested collaborating inside uh, 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 first of all these are scientific disciplines like sociology or um, actually 
probably any kind of uh, social scientific discipline. There are so-called uh, Mowgli communities. These are group of scholars which for some reason lost contact with the outside world. And, world. and this is the case of Soviet sociologists who were uh, cut from the global sociology or Anglo-American sociology by the iron cotton. It was a kind of a leaky cotton. It was not completely solid, but it was solid enough. So inside Soviet sociology, you could not, uh, recognizing influence by an American sociology could become a trouble. And that was no problem with not recognizing an American sociology. It was not even uh, a problem of in taking ideas from an American sociology and then present it, presenting them as if it were your own idea, ideas, because that was the only way of circulating these ideas. Uh, so after the same time, this Mowgli community lost then rediscover the outside world, which happened with uh, Soviet sociology during the perestroika years. And that was full of unpleasant, the moment was full of unpleasant surprises or potential surprises, because lots of ideas which uh, central figures in Soviet sociology were crediting themselves for, lots of discoveries were actually made outside of Soviet sociology by their American or European peers decades before. Um, there is a possibility, uh, I'll return to the case of Soviet sociology in a minute, but there is a possibility of emergence of this kind of um, conspiracy of silence inside smaller circles of scholars. If there are a relatively isolated community, which is uh, not communicating too much with the outside world, its members can easily start ignoring this outside world and reproduce all the discoveries made there. and praising each other for making these discoveries. Why such collaboration fails? It usually fails for two reasons. One of the reasons that that ignored subjects are often a part of an audience and they can draw attention to the ideas being reproduced or uh, possibly stolen from them. Second, if they are not present, even their original authors are not present, there are still other authors who paid attention to this, this subject. And at the moment when some, something they paid attention to is not cited, they experience an inter intellectual face loss again, because our identity as members of our discipline depends on our ability to follow the relevant sources. When it turns out that we know something we should not know, then the experience of face loss. And it's in a way comparable to the loss which occurs when we don't know something we should know. Uh, that's how we usually criticize our students. We say that they do not recognize that this uh, Weber's argument or was still that they say this is Weber's argument, but it's not because they have never read Weber well enough. So if you pay attention to somebody, we became this somebody's hostages in a way, and we want to support somebody we put our trust in. And finally, this is possible rivals in the immediate audience who are not happy about somebody gaining status because this is among other things, establish a hierarchy between them, and uh, they are ready to bring the information which will discredit, discredit their rivals. Uh, and this is finally what actually happened in Russia. Uh, the Soviet sociology, as I said, was very much isolated from the outside world, and they produced research which was large scale, but in the light of what happened in the US, in France and many other countries were not particularly original, particularly remarkable. Uh, so those who found themselves in the awkward position of finding out that they were preceded reacted with adopting very easily, adopting of uh, the, an ideology of national peculiarity, which is isolationism as I presented. They started um, establishing or constructing the national sociological tradition. They uh, exhumated Peter M. Sorokin, a Russian sociology who uh, brought America, a sociological America to its knees. And uh, from this, they took uh, an argument 
in favor of ignoring English language literature. Interestingly, in Soviet times, nobody was particularly interested in this history of Russian sociology. The boom of research in history of uh, pre-1917 Russian sociology occurred actually after, after 1991, the 90s. Uh, and there were the who were people originally, the call of this group, were younger uh, Soviet social scientists who studied abroad and then returned to Russia. And they felt free to ignore the isolationists precisely because the isolationists were unaware of recent trends in sociology and all well, in all uh, senses, intellectually not particularly credible. And that again saved them lots of time because not studying other Russian sociologists are just stigmatizing them as old fashioned, allow them to um, um, not to read their books and instead claim some of these discoveries already made as their own because they could cite Bourdieu in the preceding section of the paper. Uh, in addition to this, the assimilationists experienced what could be called a curse of small numbers because they, there were relatively few of them. And their good strategy from a career point of view was to disperse among different sub-discipline discussions. There were one person studying migration in post-Soviet Russia, another person studying electoral attitudes, the third one cultural consumption, and so on and so forth. Each of them served as a representative of Russia in these sub-discipline discussions outside of Russia, and actually found very little enforcement in terms of their own information search. They could ignore other Russian language sources, because nobody in the international discussion were aware of what was published in Russian in the 60s or 70s, of course. And they could present Russian data in a very fantastic way sometimes. So hardly somebody would notice that there are other important, more important sociology than Toshchenko, and they are for some reason are not on my graph, because I'm not sure you are very knowledgeable about Russian sociology and nobody is outside of Russia. Uh, so that's kind of a, a way of saving you know, lots of time and much of effort. And this is a form of work because there is a need in representing uh, Russia in all of these subdiscipline discussions and handbooks or kind of collective volumes. And secondly, this uh, each of the people served as a representative of the respective field out inside of Russia. And again, there were very little enforcement. You can represent sociology of sociology, or sociology of science, or sociology of culture, whatever, in, what, in Russian, in whatever way you like. Um, you can appropriate other discoveries or ascribe to Max Weber or Irving Goffman your favorite ideas, and nobody would notice this. Uh, the, in this way, what's Bert called structural holes, the broker position between different unconnected networks, get very much exploited in this situation. And it, the lack of enforcement very much facilitates ignoring relevant sources and producing, which is in no way particular regional, where you take it, but is a valuable piece of information to, to where you take it. Uh, in a way, particularly assimilationists who had a strong idea of all kind of Russian scholarship be, uh, being inferior were particularly good at ignoring each other because any kind of product, product in the Russian audience could be safely ignored just because it was in Russian. Anybody could say, well, I'm not reading Russian too much these days. And that was a respectful excuse of uh, not paying attention to, to any Russian to any Russian language source. Um, Overall, the position of social sciences, which always have to uh, act as conspiracies of silences to prove to themselves that there is any kind, some kind of news values inside them, and particularly the position of social sciences at the world periphery, very much facilitates this bubble creating uh, properties which are inherent in any kind of academic communication. Um, I think I'll stop here. I, I, I'll be very happy to answer all kinds of questions, but I feel that I have already uh, took too much time. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, now I will give a voice to our, I cannot say guest, our, our colleague here from our group, uh, Professor Pashkin. So, uh, Zekra, please, this is um, time for your comments. Okay, thank you very much, Jakub. Uh, yes, I'm sharing my screen. Yes, I'm very happy to be a co-presenter here today because I'm working on information science and research evaluation. And uh, my main aim to work with citations is to find a way to avoid counting citations, counting uh, beans for academic appointments and tenure. So that's why I choose content-based citation as a systems for my studies. But when I conduct these studies, I realized that citations have some problems in itself, so we have to solve them. And I'm very happy to see uh, Professor Sokolov's uh, presentation and read his paper because it's it's really what I want to present in the future uh, about the problems of citations. So I can start here. Uh, I think that when I, when I read uh, some papers about citation analysis, most of the citation analysis studies starting with why the author cite question because they have to understand the motivations behind uh, citations, why they want to cite someone and they don't want to cite the others. So it is the question of most of the studies, and there are many lists of uh, reasons, uh, one of the well-known reasons listed by Garfield, and he listed 15 bullets. It, it includes criticisms to others, uh, homage to pioneers, and there are, there are many different reasons for it. And I also created a scheme for my PhD thesis in 2017, and I create four different classification uh, part for citations, and one is for meaning, positive, negative, and neutral citations. One is for purpose. What is the purpose of this citation? Like, is it uh, for data, or is it for methods, or is it for comparison of papers, or something else? And uh, I have a shape class and array class, and they are um, almost most of the literature includes this kind of classification schemes. But after I finish, uh, my content-based citation analysis for Turkish and then for English and for Polish here uh, for two years, I realized some problems uh, based on ignorance of uh, citations. Like um, in some, uh, it, this, at first, in some citations, like um, people, researchers tend to cite like, this is good paper, but uh, there are some problems in it. Uh, this this kind of sentences are so uh, so rare, but there are some. Uh, for my PhD, I uh, considered this type of citations as negative because I consider uh, the sentence after part. But um, here, uh, scholarly in scholarly communication research group, we decided to add one more class to my classification scheme. Uh, named positive and negative together because it is it is the behavior of some researchers uh, they uh, not only say positive feelings but also include uh, say their negative feelings but the other problem of content based citation as the systems are uh, how to interpret negative citations it is the problem because uh, professor Sokolo mentioned the cronin's approach for citations and he he said that uh, citations are frozen footprints in the academia, and uh, one can follow these footprints and find their own way in this uh, cycle. So if uh, science will not raise grow using discussion critics, uh, how it can be possible to improve science? So I think, I believe that negative citations are also important in academia, but they are rare. Uh, I will uh, present how rare it, it is. And for uh, citation sentences, hedging is so common. Uh, 
they are turning around the world, never say the exact feelings about the papers. And they said, yes, this is not excellent paper. There are some problems in it. And this kind of language, using this kind of language is hard to understand the, the exact feelings of the authors about the papers uh, they cite. And if we cannot understand as a human the feeling of the author, the, the citer, how can machine and classify it correctly? It is my question because my aim is to classify citations using machine learning techniques, but I cannot understand the meaning of citations sometimes. So it is how it is possible to classify it using uh, machine learning techniques. But I think the main problem is uh, most of researchers uh, prefer not to cite uh, rather than making negative citations. And it is ignoring the others. Uh, in my previous study, uh, the percentage of positive citations is just 2%. And for negative citations, it is 0 0.5 or 4% uh, negative citations are I found in the literature, in library information science. And for my uh, project here in Poland, it, the numbers person is quite near. It's 5% for uh, positive citations and 3% for negative citations. So it's, it's, it's obvious that people tend to ignore, researchers tend to ignore uh, citing the others. And I think uh, the question is changing now. In the beginning, the initial question was why the author cite, but now it's how the author cite. I create some small video uh, how the author cite. If I write a paper on social network analysis, I uh, people like uh, people cite like this. They search the of science source corpus and they rank the the results in terms of their number of citations. 700 people cite this and read this. It's a good paper. Let's cite it. And without reading abstract, without reading even title, because I get a citation to my content based citation study, like it is saying, like, uh, Zehra Tashkin supports not counting citations. It is not supporting, but uh, people don't read the papers and cite them. It is, it is how uh, they cite now. Uh, maybe reviewers ask for up-to-date citations. They they change the ranking and they add some new uh, papers to their studies. And I think references is starting to lose uh, their meanings in the field. And uh, the main reason for it is uh, research evaluation systems. I think because uh, journals need high impact factors and editors ask for citations to their journals uh, because self citations are included to the uh, calculation and your colleagues can ask uh, for citations they can beg you for citations because they need citation to get the tenure and citations are starting to lose their um, meanings i think so uh, i think the main problem uh, one of the main problems is uh, publisher page culture uh, and this uh, citing behavior change of researchers, I think it's my uh, observation. And I think some initiatives and tools create, uh, make this problem bigger and bigger every day. Uh, maybe I, I think, I don't know, you know, uh, connected papers, uh, this, this uh, provides you the networks of papers in the literature, and it helps you to write your literature review, uh, literature reviews. And I think it's it's uh, fits uh, let you affect in science because if a paper cited by someone, you it is more likely to be cited uh, in the future. So I think these kind of initiatives are not good uh, to enhance citing behaviors of the uh, researchers. Uh, when the first Excite initiative launched, I, I was very happy because I 
feel that it, it can change something because they will provide uh, supporting citations, contrasting citations, and so on. But then they create a metric for journals, uh, depends on uh, citation contents, and all the verbs for, cit for uh, citation meanings are turn out to be a number uh, providing to provide to uh, the policymakers. So I think um, the main problem uh, about citation behaviors coming from uh, current research evaluation systems and tools. And my main question to Professor Sokolov is, is it possible not to ignore some people with the current research evaluation systems and tools? Because we are living in a publisher or perish world and we are missing someone, uh, deliberately or indeliberately. It, it is possible to ignore someone. Uh, if it is deliberately, it is hard to understand how what, who they ignore. Uh, for example, central countries ignore peripheral countries. Peripheral countries ignore the other peripheral countries. Institutions or research group ignores the others. So th there are different bubbles. Uh, most of them try to collaborate each other because collaboration is a good thing. But uh, I I think that it all these research evaluation systems feeds the current bubbles and we should first change the research evaluation and revise the research evaluation systems first uh yesterday i was tagging this yes not yesterday last week i was tagging citation sentences and i found uh, this sentence and i like it so much i want to finish my co presentation here uh, with the sentence, uh, a new scientific uh, yeah, I will show you. A new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up with this uh, that is familiar with it. Uh, I like this this uh, point of view of Planck, Max Planck, because uh, it always happens in scholarly communication, not for today, but for maybe whole years uh, for citation studies. Uh, that's my presentation. And that's my question to Professor Sokolov. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Zahra. Uh, OK, uh, so I would like to give uh, the voice back to Professor Sokolov um, and give him uh, opportunity to tackle this uh, question and maybe give us some initial answer before we will proceed to the um, open part of our seminar. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for the excellent question. I wish I knew the answer, of course. Uh, definitely we cannot uh, we cannot pay attention to all sources or even to all potential relevant sources but i would say that there is still a difference and it's mm, well it's uh, it's an important difference uh, between ignoring the potentially uh, import, most important sources. Uh, I mean, uh, if we find an, uh, try to imagine a sort of ideal scientific communication, uh, each of us will get information which would uh, be most likely to change the course of his or her research. Meaning there are uh, all kinds of potential sources. Definitely, we can't know in advance if the idea we need or some kind of insight we need or finding we need or technique we need is where it actually is. There is a possibility that we are searching in the course of our study of literature everywhere except the place where we find something which would change our work, give it a new direction. But sometimes we uh, not find this important bit of information uh, in spite of our searching for it. And sometimes we don't find it because we avoid searching where it's likely is situated. And there is a difference which could not be, could not always be established. I, I think even uh, 
individuals are not always aware of this. Sometimes opening a new paper is like, I don't know, opening an envelope where there is a possibly a terrible diagnosis of some kind of illness and we avoid this moment. Or I don't know how about you, but I sometimes hesitate for days to open my uh, mailbox if there is something, if the, before that there were message like uh, your, the journal got reviews and the decision is pending with editor. And then I, I, I found that I'm avoiding opening because I, I guess that could be a very unpleasant decision. Um, so that, that's something like, something like this. We do ignore something because we consciously, unconsciously think that this is uh, something important there. And our surrounding does not push up us into this direction. Or it may be that our uh, social environment uh, tacitly proves of this choice because all of us are interested in our ignoring what's going on in, say, in economics. We don't want to find out that economists did all the stuff we are currently doing or somebody else did all this stuff. Uh, so I wish there uh, could be a uh, how we can establish that this occurs? Well, sometimes people reflect. I mean, sometimes they say it honestly about themselves. Sometimes more often they are saying something about others. Like, uh, he never cites me. Uh, well, it's quite a real story uh, uh, in Russia, but I guess in other countries as well, of complaints of, uh, say, American sociologists who produced papers in uh, in English and uh, well reputed American sociological journals, not mentioning uh, papers with very similar findings published in Russian. Also, it's common knowledge that the American scholar knows Russian and was aware of these papers. And there's some kind of complaints. Um, and this, this kind of omission is usually regarded as de deliberate and an aggressive act. Uh, sometimes I think we could find the traces of this intentional and intentional, intentional suppression. Uh, I have a very Freudian imagery about this. It's like repression of some kind of forbidden thoughts and not allowing to get into consciousness. Also consciousness here is a kind of a collective consciousness of a, an audience or group of scholars. And we suppress something which is occurring in unconscious in our spheres. Um, of our psyche, not to allow it to get in. So this kind of this work of repression. And sometimes you can find out symptoms of it, like you can't uh, understand why people who are uh, writing in a very narrow topic uh, are never mentioning each other, like the topic of organized crime. I mean, it's inevitable that sociologists of organized crime do not know I don't know, all kind of research occurring in psychology of violence, for example. Also, it's potentially relevant, but it's still far enough. And there are good excuses for sociologists to disregard psychologists and organized crime, psychologists dealing with, I don't know, family violence. It could be relevant, but it's not too close. But if there is a narrow topic like organized crime wave in Russian 90s and people are disregarding each other, it's it's a bit too much. So you feel that there is some kind of explanation inside. So definitely that's a loss. We'll have to disregard possibly most relevant sources, uh, meaning the great majority of relevant sources, but we can still hope to cover all the most relevant sources. And the building a system of in academic institution, including communication, institutional communication, which facilitate or even enforce us to do this, is a task which could be achieved and that would greatly, uh, um, greatly increase the progress of accumulation of social sciences. Uh, and, and that's an interesting point about citation indices, actually. I would say that, um, as I told, they proved much, much better than actually we expected when we started uh, looking for correlation between citation measures and uh, uh, rep peer reputation. We believe there would be none because that was initially my guess. My idea was that sociologists in Russia are mostly uh, become aware of the work of other sociologists in Russia due to social media. 
And so the ones which be, would be most read are the ones who usually give interviews on television because this is the way in which information circulates. But it proved false. It was completely false. Um, and there will, well, I would say a reasonable amount of overlap. And some kind of primitive forms of gaming could be easily identified, like, say, citations, uh, self citation or citation by close peers could be detected by social network analysis. Um, and well, I would say it's it's still better than many forms of peer review in terms of possibilities for kind of collaboration or collusion between interested parties. Uh, but what actually uh, the centimetrics did and policies based of centimetrics did is changed uh, the scholarly communication among Russian scholars, and I would say most in a positive but in a very indirect way. Uh, Russia is crazy. Well, the agencies responsible for uh, science policy in Russia currently discovered for themselves the system of journal squatters, meaning who won the best papers, uh, likely to get the most amount of citation, who too is not so good, and who four is predatory journals, allegedly. So this system, and they, this system is implemented currently quite widely implemented. And that put a pressure on Russian scholars to publish, but not only publish something in predatory journals to which great amount of money allocated by Russian government to support of science was until recently used, but to publish in uh, journals with peer review. And peer review is an instrument which, well, it, uh, it could be easily built in this kind of bubbles. I mean, if there is a group of scholars, a circle, and they have journals of their own. You can see how these journals evolve, and each of them uh, creates and recreates an attention span, space of its own. The uh, field in which I published most, social, recently in sociology of culture, is divided between bubbles. One of them is sociology of culture, another uh, cultural sociology, and another one cultural, cultural studies. Uh, and I guess for an outsider, it sounds very much like all the same, but they're very different. They do not cite it common sources as well. Uh, sociology of culture is mostly quantitative, uh, very Bourdieuian about how different classes consume culture. And cultural studies are about how uh, dominant group put new meanings and cultural messages, and it's very qualitative, and it's very my, much British. And cultural sociology is school of Jeffrey Alexander, which is now Durkheimian neo-functionalism, as he himself this, uh, described this. And you guess this is three gangs of people, not in the second. There will be a deadly mistake to send your paper in the wrong journal in this case. And they're prototypical bubbles because they're still close enough from a point of view of an outsider, but they try to maximize this distance and to isolate itself, isolate as much as possible. Uh, so at least when there are no bubbles with journals of their own, Q, Q1 meaning, respectable peer review journals, you have to try to, to submit your papers to such journal. And to submit the papers to such journal, you need to read it. And I would say that from lots of scholars in Russia, that was a way of uh, getting outside of their familiar circle, just to try to read what are being read outside. And that well, in a way that created much wider horizons. Surprisingly, very surprisingly for myself, uh, I once heard this, uh, in an interview a citation by the uh, important uh, administrator in physics. In contrast to Soviet sociology and Russian sociology, physics were much more internationalized. There were no iron cotton social physicists published in the American journals and read these journals without much delay, again, in contrast to sociology. So uh, that was my impression that these problems are peculiar for social scientists. But what he said was that they implemented all the system based on in journal impact factors as a basis for regeneration in the institute he had it. And his argument for the system was not that this are necessarily good journals or this is necessarily just um, uh, just measure, or just technique for uh, distributing bonuses or benefits, but that uh, you have to make people to read and 
uh, by nature, all men and women are lazy and don't want to read, particularly something potentially disappointing. So the only way to make people in his institute to read was to oblige them to publish them, their papers in their journals they were meant to read. And the easiest way to do so was to pay bonuses for such publications. And well, there is, that's one of the leading physics institutes in Russia and the output demonstrate that they are able to, um, to publish well enough. I would say that for social sciences, which have much more problem in this respect, uh, the benefits for so far of this international publication pressures greatly overweighted is uh, its potential inefficiencies. So uh, I now act as a devil's advocate. A sociologist hates citation indexes. In the same survey, we asked them if they believe that scientometrics could be used for evaluate scholars in sociology, and the consensus was no. So nearly everybody said no, never. Unimportant, irrelevant. Surprisingly, when they were asked why they cite themselves, and there were okay, better questions like uh, most of your citation are citation of uh, important people who want to publish your paper ceremonial citation of some known names. Surprisingly, they say that they are public, themselves cite only relevant sources, but in general, they do not believe in scientometrics. Um, but uh, in spite of this skepticism, which is universal, I guess now Russia is not exceptional in this sense, uh, sometimes its usages could have, at least in the short run, some positive effects, some precisely in the area uh, of the attention spaces building and formation and transformation, which, which I address today. Um, so that's a very, I'm afraid, very amorphous answer to your excellent question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, we have still some time left and I think it's a high time we invite the others to join us. Um, and uh, question to the audience, do you have some question? I see already that Christian is uh, um, waving his hand. Um, any other questions? Okay, let's begin with Christian, the voice is yours. Okay, hello, I'm Christian Szatkowski from uh, Scholarly Communication Research Group. Uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Sokol, for wonderful paper. I've read your paper with it absolutely high interest. I think this is like a great example of how to write a sociological, th theoretical, and at the same time empirical dance paper. And I think that uh, this is uh, example of a science that we all need to be uh, doing, but it's uh, more and more uh, harder to, to publish in uh, Western journals because it's not, uh, like simply dense, large, long, and uh, and relevant, I would say. And uh, uh, with this introduction, I would uh, like to ask your opinion about some specific trends that influence the pro uh, phenomenon of inattention. First uh, of all, how would you, uh, uh, what would you say about the uh, contribution of these new trends that we all are more and more forced to publish globally, internationally, in English, uh, and in English, uh, how this contributes to the motives be, uh, behind inattention. Because part of what you discuss in the paper was this interesting story of what were the, for example, material conditions of uh, sociologists in Russia during the transition period that enables them simply to know each other's work and so on. But I think that uh, uh, recently we are uh, facing the, some structural geopolitical uh, conditions that, that would only deepen this materiality of conditions of uh, inattention that we will be less and less uh, allowed to refer, this is also something from your from your paper, the, the, we will be less and less allowed to use the local knowledge in order to argue through citations or uh, construct our arguments through citation practices 
uh, in this uh, anglophone space. So, so, so I would simply uh, ask uh, a question about your reflection about the geopolitical context of the recent changes in the phenomenon of inattention. Well, mm -hmm. like, what is the position and the role of uh, of peripheries? Is there any hope? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for for the kind words about the paper. Uh, indeed, that's a very intriguing question. Uh, a very intriguing question. I uh, I don't have a ready answer. As I told before, I think that uh, at least for the attention space in social sciences in Russia, as it existed, as it emerged, um, opening to the English-speaking world was was a benefit. Uh, definitely, when we find in uh, that's a new problems that are emerging. Again, I think that a kind of divide my colleagues and I described for St. Petersburg and now for Russia is a very universal thing. It cannot disappear completely just because uh, social sciences, sociology, sociology particular, uh, is uncertain about its raison d'etre, its reason for being. Uh, officially, it says that it's an instrument of public enlightenment. And the public enlightenment is to occur the language which the respective public speaks, which means Russian or Polish or uh, any other language in any uh, not in no English language country. And on the other hand, this is definitely English, which is increasingly used for academic communication, and which is regarded by the funding bodies or ministries uh, as the one in which well. Uh, academic results should be presented or this kind of work is rewarded. And we mostly find some certain forms of arrangement. Uh, what we try to do, we'll hope we'll do with this study of disciplines, which is currently under, uh, is to find out, is to draw some comparative research between disciplines and between countries on how they, uh, on which arrangements emerge as a result. Seems that the most typical arrangement is the one which was described for Latin American countries by Fernanda Bigel and her colleagues, in which there is kind of a two tier system. There is uh, upper tier universities in which everybody is publishing in English, and they are technocratic, apolitical, doing mostly quantitative research, largely doing research being themselves in Argentina, doing research using US databases because it's easier this way to get in the top US journals. Uh, and there is a lot of tiers institutions which are having much, uh, much, much greater teaching load, teaching is done in Spanish and publishing is done in Spanish and they are much more politicized. They are doing research which is not particularly feed these journals oriented to methodology and methodological novelties but they uh, they are doing something which is closer to the debates in their own country. And this kind of specialization is nearly inevitably, will inevitably emerges and reemerges just because, well, both are quite demanding things. It did publishing papers in English is demanding, writing in Facebook is demanding if you want 10,000 followers. And in Russia, there is an increasing divide between sociologists, which are mostly active in uh, Facebook, and the ones which are mostly active uh, in Facebook in Russia, uh, surprisingly for people in many other countries, is mostly is used as a major uh, outlet for political, particular oppositional communication. Uh, so uh, most critics of Vladimir Putin could be fine and uh, in Facebook, and sociologists are prominent in this, but sociologists are prominent in this have little time for international publishing. And this kind of two specializations, I guess, quite soon people uh, will not know active in Facebook and sociology and public interest in public debate in Russia. Most they will not know the names of Russian sociologists residing in Russia and working in high school of economics who have the largest hash index in web of science. Uh, so this kind of divide is inevitable. 
And one way of arrangement is this kind of hierarchical. It could occur that uh, one of the fields uh, will completely destroy the other, or that an old establishment, uh, one establishment will control both arenas. That was my idea was that was the case in France until relatively recently, when there were like consolidated establishment having greatest possibility of symbolic violence, and it was monopolizing the access to both kind of audiences. Uh, but but not countries like Russia, and in which is very strong divide and very surprisingly supported by the both uh, parts are. Uh, have enormous possibilities for reproduction because they get support from the same state. If you publish papers in English, you get support because that corresponds very well to different kind of objective measures implemented by the Ministry for Science and Education, and they get funds and get money. But at the same time, if you're publishing in Russian, what you publish in English is usually is sometimes think which could not be published in Russia, or you're not recommended to try this. Uh, and there are other people who are publishing in Russia, and they promise patriotic education um, of students, and they have funding from the same state, but it's a different channel. So this kind of divide is uh, largely supported by, by the state itself. Uh, this is possibly not the typical story for other countries, but in Russia, it very much su uh, support the present condition. There, well, resume is that uh, I'm not sure that in sociology at least uh, that is likely that this kind of global communication will totally suppress communication in national languages because there are still audiences and there is still feeling of importance of addressing these audiences and enormous amount of work. At best, the academic world could be stratified with their more money going to the hands of those who publish in English and less money going to those who are not, but uh, any kind of total annihilation is, is unlikely. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, so uh, please forgive me, uh, I, I, I don't want to misspell um, the name, but uh, uh, Karahil. Karahil. Uh, so, uh, hello. My name is Christina Archiluk. I'm here from Ecom, Belgium, Flanders. So I just started my PhD and I'm trying to understand uh, something. So when we're saying that something is good or something is bad or a situation is good or bad, we should have a frame of reference. So what, what is for you the ideal behavior of researchers in uh, social sciences and humanities in Russia and not only in Russia, but globally? Uh, well, I think this is uh, this is formulated by uh, what I answered to Zera. Uh, Zera, excuse me. Uh, uh, this is being able to uh, being ready to recognize the most likely influences on your work. Uh, this is nothing new about this. This is in no way uh, my uh, own idea here. Possibly the most, um, the best presentation of this danger was an old book by Richard Feynman uh, in which he describes cargo cult. Uh, I think in English it's like, you must be joy joking Mr. Feynman, but I read it in Russian, yeah. So he describes cargo cult and says he he's talking about psychologists, but it applies in his view, at least as a physicist, all kind of social sciences scientists. He says that uh, well, they want to get a publishable papers and know the understanding of how things work and how. So he describes some kind of animal psychologists which are making uh, experiments with worms and. Uh, there is a tradition of experimenting with worms, which specifies which variables uh, should be um, controlled for. And there are other variables. That's about the uh, movements of a worm in a, uh, in a small labyrinth. 
say the warm tom's left or tom's right, uh, right and this is an animal learning and they control for some things and not other things like the surfaces for example which are potentially relevant and then somebody controls for these for many variables which are usually not controlled and this paper not is not getting published just because it uh, unknows all the previous papers all the people who are doing this ex experimentation for the case, all the authors of the field find out that their experimentation is possibly not relevant. And they just try to ignore this paper because it uh, undermines the authority. Uh, that's what's happening with all kinds of bubbles, I would say, discipline bubbles, when we try to ignore something which is dangerous because all our already established authority is based on knowledge claims and this knowledge claims prove to be unoriginal or, or simply wrong. So this is, I would say the bad thing. And the good thing is, is quite the opposite. Okay, uh, Zekra, would you like to add something to, to the question already uh, posed? Uh I think Mr. Sokolov's answer is quite enough. And I'm I'm very happy to listen as sociologist uh, point of view for citations because I'm not a sociologist, but I like to read uh, sociology of science uh, papers. So uh, I'm very happy to be a co-presenter today. <laughs> Thank you very much. The pleasure was all mine. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I cannot see any further questions and, uh, ah, uh, sorry, uh, Emmanuel. Yes, uh, I have a question from the meta level about self-reflexivity -re of Russian sociologists and social scientists. How do uh, Russian sociologists uh, perceived your work and perceived your papers about Russian sociologists. Because I think this level of self-reflexivity is extremely important when we discuss ignoring other researchers. How, so how your work is perceived and treated uh, in Russia? Well, uh, it was not ignored. Uh, most dislike it strongly, but it's a kind of a career strategy aimed at becoming notorious, doing sociology of sociology works perfectly. Uh, regretfully, there were not much attempts of refutation. So, uh, and that's what disapp greatly disappoints me because uh, this is partly a problem I, I wanted to discuss today with having a single specialist in each field and non-intersecting fields of expertise. Um, you can write about a group of people, a group of people says they like it, or they more likely they dislike it, and then nothing happens like there is no kind of alternative vision of the same data or nobody tried to carry similar surveys in order to gather other results. Um, so people are understandably interested in what, on what, in what is being written about themselves. But regretfully, I wouldn't say that there is a kind of traditional sociology of sociology in Russia. Um, nobody particularly tried to develop a, another vision of the same facts. So, um, I'm sorry, I definitely am sorry to say this, but uh, that's typical for, again, I would say that might be typical. It's my feeling that this is typical for many countries in which there are not the, that many social sciences, even they are reading each other at all. They're very unlikely to uh, try to challenge each other's views or positions. And as sociology of sociology is necessarily a small field, in it, maybe in, I don't know if there is a Polish sociology of sociology who would monopolize this field in the country, but I would say it might be, might be likely from what we know about how the field works. 
Okay, um, any further questions? All right, uh, in this case, um, I would like to once again uh, thank Professor Sokol for taking his time and joining us today and presenting uh, his research. Also, big thanks for uh, Zehra for um, giving her comments on, on, on the issue. Uh, just a small announcement. We now go on a holiday hiatus uh, with our seminar cycle, but uh, we will be back probably in September with uh, some news about the, uh, our future plans and our future guests. So please uh, follow our, uh, us in social media. Uh, we will definitely post um, information about upcoming events uh, after the holidays. And um, once again, big thank you. A big, big thank you for, for also to the whole audience for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.